All right, well, it is 12 o'clock. So thank you everyone who's joined us today for another agricultural law and policy webinar. Uh, I'm Ebony Woodruff, the director of the Agricultural Law Institute for Underrepresented and Underserved Communities at Southern University Law Center, where our mission is to promote equity and social justice in the agricultural system by providing accessible legal education and representation to empower farmers and agricultural communities facing systemic challenges. Our mission is to cultivate legal literacy, protect farmers' rights, and ensure the prosperity and security of underrepresented and underserved communities. Today, we are joined by Mr. Rodney Brooks, who is detailed to the House Agriculture Committee as a policy staffer since May of 2021. His portfolio areas on the committee primarily focuses on issues around credit, beginning farmers, and the farm safety net. Prior to the detail assignment, he served as the beginning farmer regional He coordinated and implemented agency-wide outreach activities to beginning farmers, ranchers, and stakeholders who can benefit from the agency's programs and resources. He previously has served as a farm loan officer for over 10 years, and before that as a temporary worker in the administrative division of the Georgia State FSA office while attending a graduate school. During his undergrad studies, he interned in the Brooks Company, FSA field office during summer and Christmas vacations. Mr. Brooks has attained a BS and MS degree in agricultural economics from Fort Valley State University and the University of Georgia respectively. And so before I pass it over, I do want to thank our partners at the National Agricultural Law Center uh, because of a partnership between the National Ag Law Center and Southern University Law Center, the Agricultural Law Institute was created. And so thank you to our partners. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Mr. Brooks. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and expertise about the Farm Bill and specifically the credit title. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And Ebony, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity uh, to use this platform to share a little bit of information about the credit title of the Farm Bill. And uh, I'll go ahead and begin sharing my screen for the PowerPoint presentation. Right, there we go. Um, again, Rodney Brooks, uh, detailee uh, to the House Ag Minority uh, committee, which is led by ranking member David Scott of the 13th district of the great state of Georgia. Uh, today, I just want to give a real high level overview of uh, the credit title of the farm bill. Uh, it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. Typically, I like to give presentations in person and engage with the audience and ask the questions back and forth. Uh, I know personally, uh, when it comes to PowerPoint presentations, uh, sometimes I get a little too uh, when folks have slides up and read primarily verbatim from the slides. And I will tell you today, I am going to be one of those people for the most part. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in my opinion, more of a factual webinar and not so much as my opinions. And so I just want to take down some of the information uh, that we've received and just convey it to you all. Uh, disclaimer from the top, uh, the... The majority of this presentation has been derived from Jim Monk at the Congressional Research Service. Uh, the CRS is a great resource for all matters policy related, and I will encourage you to go on their website or build relationships with any of the staffers over there. They're great people to work with, and um, they have a great level of expertise in the certain choosing fields that they uh, preside over. And with that, we'll get started. So what we'll do today is first we'll uh, begin to talk about what the Farm Bill does for credit. And then I give you a brief overview of agricultural lending. And then we'll talk about uh, the description of the three entities that primarily lend money 
uh, through the lens of the credit title of the farm bill. First, we have the USDA Farm Service Agency. Secondly, we have the Farm Credit System. And lastly, we have Farmer Mac. And in closing, I will discuss proposed changes in House Bill 8467, which is the uh, uh, current farm bill that we have that was passed out of committee a few months ago with an uh, entire Republican supporting committee. And we have four members of the Democratic side who also voted to pass that legislation. So we'll talk about the the uh, guiding legislation that uh, affects uh, credit title of the farm bill. We have the Consolidated Farm and Rural Development Act of 1961, more commonly referred to as the CON Act. And this oversees uh, the USDA Farm Service, farm Service Agency farm loan programs. And also we have the Farm Credit Act of 1971, more commonly referred to as the Farm Credit Act. And that has jurisdiction over the farm credit system, farmer MAC, and the Farm Credit Administration. Uh, the Farm Credit Administration is the regulator for both the farm credit system as well as farmer MAC. And here we'll just a graph of where farm debt lies. And we see we have up top uh, approximately 10% of farm debt is held by individuals and others, 4% by life insurance companies, 36% commercial banks, 2% uh, by former MAC, 44% by the farm credit system, and approximately 3% by the farm, farm service agents. And if we look at that chart, we can see the, uh, the variability from 1980 up into 2020 of uh, the different organizations and entities that hold farm-related debt. And the farm crisis of the early 80s, you can see where the Farm Service Agency uh, looks like at its height uh, around the mid, nineteen between 85 and 1990, uh, their farm debt was approximately 16 to 17%. And to now where we currently stand, where farm credit holds approximately 3%, of our agricultural debt. And the biggest holder of farm debt is the farm credit system. And then over to the right, we see that uh, approximately 30% of farms have debt. And then we look at the type of debt that those farms hold. Uh, approximately 65% are based in real estate loans, 35% based in farm operating loans, which will include, include production loans, as well as intermediate loans to uh, finance equipment, shadows, and things of, of, of that sort. And then we'll look at the uh, asset holdings of uh, these farms. Real estate, which of course God is not making any more dirt. So typically when someone gets their hand on farm real estate or real estate in general, they try to keep a hold of it. And it accounts for about 82% of farm assets and machinery and vehicle, vehicles account for 9% of farm assets. And we know like in any business, uh, solvency is a very important important part of sustaining that business. And it's, uh, that same thing applies for farming and agriculture as well. We know the margins on farm operations are very slim, very tight. And so you wanna make sure that you're able to be able to stay in business and control as much as your debt as possible. And here we see these two charts here and we look at the number of farm assets and farm debt. And you see from 1980 up until 2020, uh, farm assets and farm debt uh, typically follow the same trend. And uh, we know since then with the advances in technology and innovation, it has gotten more and more expensive to farm. So that means it's gonna cost more money to farm. And those, those million dollar cotton pickers that folks happen to buy, uh, debt comes associated with that as well as everything else that goes on in the farm sector. And then we'll, this next two charts, we'll look at the farm debt to asset ratio or farm debt to income ratio. And again, I, I keep harkening back to the early 80s. Of course, in the early 80s, there was a significant farm crisis where uh, there were a lot of folks going out of business in the farming sector. Prices were not good. We had some droughts throughout the country and it was just a perfect storm of everything going wrong in the farming and agriculture sector. And these ratios follow that same trend as well. 
And right now, around 15% form the debt asset ratio. And then about approximately 4% 4, 4 of form the debt to income ratio. And uh, from an economic standpoint, you, you want to keep those things as much under control as possible. And uh, I, I think out here in farm country with the looming uh, economic uh, distress that money farmers and ranchers are experiencing throughout the country, uh, these numbers may shoot up uh, once they're adjusted again in the next five to 10 years. Next, we'll talk about the three primary lenders that uh, operate under uh, the credit title of the farm uh, of the farm bill. As stated earlier, I was a farm loan officer for about 10 years out in the field uh, with the Farm Service Agency in Southwest Georgia. And prior to that, I also had the opportunity to work with the farm credit system in uh, Southwest Georgia as well. Uh, the Farm Service Agency, uh, for years, it was considered the lender of last resort. But more recently, uh, the department uh, uh, began to define themselves as the lender of first opportunity. Uh, it may be a matter of semantics, but uh, when someone walks in the door and wants to get a farm loan from FSA, you know, uh, there's a, there may be a, a perceived difference of this is my last stop or is the first place that I can go to get started. And at FSA, uh, you have farm ownership loans uh, and you also have farm operating loans to uh, that are made available to individuals who are unable to receive uh, credit elsewhere. Uh, we also have the guaranteed loan program where uh, guaranteed lenders, uh, whether they be commercial banks or members of the farm credit system, uh, make and service loans with a guarantee of repayment from FSA up to 95% in case of default. Additionally, at FSA, there's a targeted amount of funds that are reserved for beginning farmers and ranchers, as well as targeted funds for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers by race, ethnicity, and gender. Here we'll look at the current uh, maximum loan limits uh, to FSA loans, uh, our direct farm ownership loans, uh, maximum limits currently at 600,000 for operating purposes at 400,000. And we have our micro loan program, which is a streamlined program for that is aimed at uh, new and beginning producers uh, have a maximum loan limit of $50,000. And under our direct loan pro, I'm sorry, direct emergency loan program, you can borrow up to five hundred thousand dollars. And lastly, we have our guaranteed loan programs, uh, with a maximum amount of an indebtedness at two point two three six million dollars, and that's adjusted annually on inflation. And with the guaranteed loans, you'll see that there is not a, a distinction between ownership and operating loans. Uh, that's the cumulative value maximum value of loans that can be made on a guaranteed loan program, whether it be uh, all in operating expenses or all in ownership loans. 2.236 million is the current value of that. And one thing that's uh, been paramount upon FSA lenders, I'm sorry, borrowers, as the number of uh, years that they're eligible for assistance, uh, this topic has been contentious for a little while. And you'll see here that on our direct loan programs, for operating purposes, you have six years plus a possible two-year extension. And if loan officers and farm loan managers are creative, you can possibly stretch that into a nine to 10-year form operating cycle, depending on when you uh, schedule those loan programs. And we also have 10 years for our farm ownership loans. But if you look to the right, our guaranteed loan term limits or do not exist. Uh, you can borrow money under a guaranteed loan program uh, without any end. And as of September 30th, 2023, uh, the direct and guaranteed loan portfolio at the Farm Service Agency was approximately $33.1 billion. And those loans were made to a little over 115,000 borrowers. Uh, during this current administration, there has been some improvements facing, made to the customer-facing delivery of farm loans at FSA. Uh, first, uh, there's been published streamlined direct farm loan applications uh, for FS new, FSA's new online direct farm loan application form. It was reduced from 
29 pages to 13 pages with the average completion time reduced to about 50 percent. And so as a loan officer, when I was in the field years ago, that was one of the common complaints among applicants, uh, the length of the application. Uh, many folks felt that you needed outside assistance to be able to properly complete this application. And those pleas were heard. And again, that application has been uh, reduced from 29 pages to 13 pages. Uh, we've also introduced the Enhanced Online Loan Assistance Tool. And this is a step-by-step -step guide to loan products and eligibility used by customers as they consider to apply for direct loans. Uh, it sort of gives them a sort of like a prequel, so to speak. Uh, they put in certain information on this loan application tool and it tells them what types of loans that may qualify and the eligibility requirements for those loans. And lastly, we launched an online version of our direct loan application, uh, which is uh, very important considering that many in the commercial lending space already have this product available and not that uh, FSA loan products compete with the farm credit system or conventional lenders. Uh, we just wanna make sure that our customers have some of the same accessibility that uh, customers of those other lending institutions have as well. And next we'll talk about the farm credit system. And the farm credit system is a GSC, which is a government sponsored entity. It is not a government program or a government agency. A lot of people get it confused. Uh, they're two different things. Uh, I've seen legislation that uh, wants to uh, uh, take some of the profits from the farm credit system and apply them elsewhere. And, and in essence, outside of being a government-sponsored entity, uh, the farm credit system is a for-profit lender, but it does have a statutory mandate to serve agriculture. And that eligibility is limited to farmers and ranchers, certain farm-related agribusinesses, cooperatives, rural homeowners and towns, with the populations of less than 2,500. And all of that uh, said, uh, Farm Credit System is not a lender resort, a last resort. Again, they operate for profit and they make loans to credit worthy borrowers. And uh, the Farm, Cur Farm Credit System uh, consists of a network of borrower owned lending institutions, four large banks allocate funds to approximately 64 credit associations. And one thing that I like to note about uh, the farm credit system, it's the only one of the federal government sponsored entities like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that is a direct lender. They lend money directly to farmers and ranchers throughout the country. And one of the great benefits of being a customer of a farm credit system institution is that patronage refund program where they allow profits uh, to be given back to their borrowers uh, based on the performance of the system and the institution. And then we have uh, some tax exempt stat, exempts from credit. Uh, some of the income from those bonds are tax exempt, the bondholders, and some of the profits from the, are live, some of the profits from the lending are tax exempt to the farm credit system entities as well. And no federal appropriations dollars go to the uh, fund the farm credit system. Uh, again, back to being a for-profit organization and entity, uh, they raise their capital by selling bonds on Wall Street. And some of the financials for uh, farm credit system through the second quarter of this year, uh, they had a portfolio of approximately $400, $406 billion in loans and approximately $254 billion of that uh, included farm loans which were made of general ag loans, production loans, and intermediate loans. And currently their market share of all farm loans in the U.S. is about 46% of uh, the U.S. Set, of the U.S. farm loan debt, farm debt rather. And as I stated earlier, I talked, we looked at the chart and we, we saw commercial banks also play a role in the uh, agricultural lending space. And the farm credit system uh, competes directly with commercial banks uh, throughout this country and vying for customers and being able to provide that lending service uh, to farmers and ranchers throughout this country. Okay, and then lastly, we have Farmer Mac. 
It was also created in the Farm Credit Act. And as stated earlier, it shares the Farm Credit Administration as its regulator with a farm credit uh, system. Uh, Farmer Mac is a secondary market for agricultural lending, and it purchases and pools qualified loans. And they may have said these loans to investors as securities, or they may even hold these loans on their own. And they provide a risk management tool for lenders to make more loans and satisfy regulatory requirements. Uh, financially and organizationally separate from the farm credit system, uh, they may share farmer or farm in its title, but they are two separate and distinct uh, entities and organizations. Uh, they're an investor-owned corporation with total business volume of approximately $24.5 billion, and that's mainly from farm and ranch loans, followed by rural utilities, corporate agriculture finance, renewable energy loans. And they currently hold a farm sh market share of farm loans of about 2% directly. Okay, and so we'll move on to some proposed changes in H.R. 8467, which again was passed out of committee a few months ago with full Republican support and four Democrats uh, siding with the Republicans to pass this bill out of committee. Uh, first, it will reauthorize appropriations, make several changes to certain provisions uh, and some of these provisions would also modify the Farm Credit Act as well as the Cunn Act. Uh, one of the reauthorizations of appropriations would be to the State Agricultural Loan Mediation Program. And this is a program where uh, applicants or borrowers who have received um, adverse decisions from the Farm Service Agency uh, can mediate and, and instead of filing an appeal and try to come to some type of understanding about uh, what went wrong with the process and work out the differences. Also, uh, in this proposed legislation, there's an increase in the maximum loan limits to individuals and entities who borrow money from the Farm Service Agency. Uh, stated earlier, uh, the cost to operate uh, farms and ranch, ranches have grown uh, over the past few years. Rises in costs that are associated with inputs as well as uh, the depressed commodity prices uh, makes it even more expensive to uh, to uh, grow food, fiber, and all the things that are sustainable uh, through farming and ranching. And so proposed changes would increase the micro loan limit from $50,000 to $100,000, uh, will increase the direct farm ownership loan from $600,000 to $850,000, and will increase the farm operating loan from $400,000 to $750,000, while also uh, increasing the guaranteed loan limit uh, between three and five millions, three and five, three and three point five million million, $3.5 million, depending on whether or not it's a farm ownership loan or a farm operating loan. And also uh, it would eliminate the separate limit on down payment loans. Uh, that's a little bit more into the weeds. The down payment loan program is a program that's administered uh, through the Farm Service Agency uh, with commercial lenders, including farm the farm credit system, where an applicant uh, may put down a certain percentage on a farm real estate purchase, and then uh, a third party lender, whether it be commercial or farm credit system, would then um, finance the rest of the operation or the rest of the purchase price. Also, uh, one of the proposed changes is to permit uh, the farm credit system to make loans for essential community facilities. Uh, this has been a topic of contention with commercial lenders. Uh, uh, many commercial lenders don't think that farm credit system should be in this space, uh, considering that uh, essential facility, uh, community essential facility loans, which were possibly include uh, hospitals, daycares, things of that nature are, are not related to agriculture. But uh, there appears to be a void out in the countryside where uh, some of these uh, entities are not being properly uh, financed and farm credit system sees this out as an opportunity to get into this space and to continue to enhance the lives of the men and men, men and women out of rural America. Also, 
uh, expand qualified loans for former MAC. And this would allow former MAC to include qualified loans uh, under the guaranteed portion of the REAP program, which is the Rural Energy for America program that is administered, administered by uh, rural development. And lastly, we have uh, some heirs property relenting expansion. Currently, the heirs property relenting program is geared towards a loan program to heirs property members to help them clear title in order to be able to receive uh, the full services afforded to them by USDA programs. Uh, and expenses of this program would now possibly include a grant program to third party entities to uh, provide the same services, which would also include financial services uh, to heirs property members and allow them to not have to incur any upfront expenses in clearing title in order to keep the farm in the family's name and to keep it in operation. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions. You're muted, Abby. I was saying thank you so much, Rodney, for uh, coming and joining us today and sharing the information. And so while I wait for questions to roll in from our attendees, I did have a few um, points of clarification just for anyone who may not know. So at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about um, direct versus guaranteed loans. Could you just explain the difference between those two for anyone who may not know? Yes, um, our direct loans at the Farm Service Agency are loans that are funded, made, and serviced directly by uh, local FSA loan offices, whereas our guaranteed loan program is a program where conventional, conventional or commercial lenders, including uh, members of the farm credit system, make and service uh, those loans directly to farmers and ranchers throughout the country. Uh, FSA guarantee those, guarantees those loans in case the borrower defaults up to a level of 95%. Okay. And then you were talking about, or you had referred to operating and ownership loans. Would you explain the difference between those, please? Yes. Uh, farm ownership loans is when an applicant uh, uh, intends to purchase farm real estate or make any improvements to farm real estate. And those improvements may include uh, irrigation or a well. Anything that's affixed to the land may be included on our farm ownership program. Our farm operating loan program is where uh, borrowers use those funds to purchase uh, inputs for the operations, whether it be seed, fertilizer, chemicals, things of that nature, as well as uh, equipment and chattels, livestock. Uh, things that uh, don't have the same useful life, use, useful life as a uh, farm real estate. Okay. And then just a point of clarification, because you had referenced the farm service agency and then also the farm credit system. Are they connected or are these separate entities? Two totally separate entities. Uh, the Farm Service Agency is an agency under the USDA umbrella. The Farm Credit System is a government-sponsored entity uh, that lends money for profit to farmers and ranchers throughout the country, whereas uh, the Farm Service Agency does not lend for profit. And that's one of the reasons why you'll see interest rates at the Farm Service Agency um, much lower than uh, Farm Credit System members or conventional, bank, conven conventional banks. Okay, thank you. And because our goal here is to educate our attendees, could you speak briefly or, you know, take as much time as you want uh, about the farm bill process? And so what is it like to actually get a farm bill passed? What is that process like? Well, uh, during this cycle, uh, the House leads uh, so to speak, with the pen on the farm bill. So as I stated earlier, it was passed out of the House Agriculture Committee earlier in the year. 
And so the next step ideally would be for that bill to be put on the House floor to be voted by all members of Congress. And then uh, the Senate, you would hope, would come together in conference with uh, members of the House with the bill that they passed and sit down at the table and work out any differences that they may have. But as it currently speak, as we as I currently speak, the Senate has not put forth any legislative text on the farm bill. They have put out a framework, uh, but no one has seen text. And at this point, uh, it still takes uh, bipartisan uh, votes to get this thing across the finish line. And we like to call it the four corners uh, leadership and the House and Senate, both minority and majority side, sitting down at the table and working out their differences and putting together a, a good bill for farmers and ranchers throughout this country. At this point, uh, there has been a little angst that we don't have a farm bill considering uh, the uh, – the uh, economic nature of what's going on out in the countryside with uh, depressed commodity prices and higher input costs. And also uh, these natural disasters that appear to be occurring more frequently. And right now I'm in Southwest Georgia and, and there's a hurricane that's, that's getting ready to bear down on us. And there's been reports that it may potentially be as detrimental as Hurricane Michael was back in 2018. And uh, that type of event will have a very, very negative effect on the commodities that are growing out in the field. So more recently, there has been uh, growing interest and support for a farm bill to get done or some type of ad hoc uh, assistance to be put in place for the current uh, economic climate that farmers and ranchers are experiencing. Uh, more recently, I, I think, that I've heard or been told that the Four Corners principals, have, or at least the staff directors, have uh, been talking and possibly uh, looking forward to working out something. But ultimately, I think it comes down to the leadership of those Four Corners, the chairman and the ranking members of both Senate Ag and House Ag, to hammer out any differences that they may have before uh, – this thing can uh, actually be passed and put into law. Thank you for that explanation. And so there aren't any questions coming in from the audience or our attendees, but I have one final question. And I'd like you to tell our attendees, you know, for the average American citizen who wants to be more involved in this process, you know, what are some tips um, or advice that you have for people to be more engaged in the farm bill process? You know, how can they, if they have an opinion about legislation, you know, can they just call up the um, committee or submit, you know, their views about what's going on? How can one be more involved and engaged in this process? Yeah, you can definitely uh, submit any type of views or recommendations that you may have uh, as it pertains to the Farm Bill. But I would encourage you to first uh, begin with your member, uh, your elected congressman or woman or your state senators, and talk to them about the issues that you see and any type of recommendations that you have and allow them to, to be that voice for you. Uh, of course, we all know those are ultimately the men and women who have to vote on this type of legislation. And the more voices that they can have in their heads hammering at certain issues, uh, the more it's important to them, from my understanding. So I would say start with your members and uh, any issues that you're having uh, in regards to farming and agriculture uh, that's being affected by the farm bill process. Definitely reach out to your members and they, they can forward that information on up. Uh, and voice their concerns as well. Uh, the committee is is comprised of members on each side, and each member has different priorities. Uh, a member from Southwest Georgia uh, does not have the same priorities as a member from the Midwest where uh, corn and wheat and soybeans are the primary crops. But at the same time, uh, the programs and the resources that are afforded by the Farm Bill are needed in the Midwest 
in the South, all over the country. And so it, it's important that the members uh, come to an agreement that we may not always uh, have the same priorities, but the ultimate priority is to the security of our food system in this country and to make sure that we have a good farm bill for the farmers and ranchers uh, throughout this country to make sure that they continue to be able to produce and provide the food, fiber, and shelter that it takes to feed and clothe the world. Uh, one thing that I would also like to add that I did not touch on since we only talked about the credit title of the farm bill, uh, the nutrition title has historically been a very uh, controversial and contentious title in the farm bill. And the one thing that I would like to uh, reiterate, and this is solely a view of Rodney. Uh, this view does not represent the views of the member of the House Agriculture Committee, but I think it's uh, very important that the nutrition title uh, is included because it takes both members from urban, rural, and suburban areas to be able to pass this type of legislation. And I'm afraid uh, this country has grown more urban and rural I'm sorry, urban and suburban. So members from rural parts of the country uh, don't member as large as other members. And so if we were to separate it out, I, I think it would become a little bit more difficult to pass a bipartisan bill that, that truly benefits farmers and ranchers. And again, that is Rodney's view. That is not the view of House Ag. But uh, that's my two cents on that topic. Thank you. And, you know, thank you for the additional commentary. I am looking forward uh, to hosting a webinar regarding the nutrition title uh, in the future. So thank you for that. And then I thought that was my final question, but then one came up as you were speaking. For people to tune in and listen uh, when they're having these committee meetings and, you know, uh, discussing the farm bill and where would one, if they actually wanted to read the farm bill, where could they find that? Uh, it's published online. Um, I can't cite you the specific source at a time, but I can afterwards. As far as the hearings, uh, typically the majority does stream uh, the hearings on their YouTube page. And depending on the uh, the nature of the hearing, sometimes the hearings are also aired on C-SPAN. And you can always Google and go back and pull up the previous hearings as well. All right. Well, with that, since there aren't any questions coming in, I'm going to wrap this up. So thank you again, Mr. Brooks, for joining us, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. you know, is impending upon your area. And so our prayers and thoughts are with you, you know, as your Louisiana neighbors, we <laughs> definitely understand, um, you know, the whole process of, you know, hurricanes. And so prayers and thoughts are with you and everyone over there in Georgia and Florida, you know, areas that will be impacted by this. Thank you to our attendees for taking time out of your day to join us, you know, everyone has busy schedules and there's probably a million other things that you could have been doing with this time, but you came here today. And so we thank you for that. So on behalf of the Agricultural Law Institute for Underrepresented and Underserved Communities, as well as our partners at the National Ag Law Center, I thank you for joining us today. Again, my name is Ebony Woodruff. I'm the director of the Ag Law Institute. For anyone who wants to reach out, you can email me at ebony.woodruff at suLC.edu. You can also email the institute at Ali, A-L-I, for Agricultural Law Institute at suLC.edu. Please join us next week where we will be joined by Latanya Brown, who will be speaking about agricultural mediations so that is next Thursday, October 3rd at 12 p.m. Central. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, special thanks to you, Mr. Brooks. We really appreciate you coming here today. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. You all have a great day. Okay, bye.